mobile software, but um, and um, mainly I, I will talk about um, what if you don't want to use um, mobile backend as a service, which is already available, or some of these um, uh, frameworks and technologies like like Aerogear or IBM Worklight. Um, what if you really want to build your own custom solution and maybe uh, build it really easily and you don't have all those requirements, you just need a simple sol solution to, to get the job done. And um, one of my main concerns <coughs> was this data storage and to be able to easily build up um, a column-based data store or document-based uh, data stores and make them available for mobile developers. And uh, the technologies uh, we use there are based on Vertex and MongoDB. So, and the great thing is, um, Vertex runs on the JVM. I don't know uh, who of you has already heard of Vertex. Okay. And Node.js. So, to simplify things, uh, you can, if you hear Vertex, you can think of Node.js running on the JVM. Um, it's, <coughs> it's an application framework um, with some very special, special features I want to, would like to introduce to you because I think it's, it's a great piece, piece of, of software. Um, it was developed by uh, Tim Fox. He's the guy who um, created HornetMQ and worked on the RabbitMQ project. And um, I think he's, he's a very experienced architect and he brought this project into, into life. And he, he's done an amazing job. He worked for VMware and uh, I think just last week I heard that he's going back to Red Hat. Yeah, yeah, and, and he, uh, the nice thing about Vertex, I think also why it fits so good it, into the uh, Java user group is it's JVM based. Right. Um, that's on the <coughs> JVM. It's a general purpose application framework. Uh, it's made up of asynchronous APIs. What that means, I will show you a little bit later. It um, has a polyglot approach. That means you can write your application in different languages and integrate them um, and you can for example at the moment supported is Java, JavaScript, Python, Ruby and Groovy. Um, uh, it's currently worked on the Clojure and Scala um, version. Oh, but this this is all server side right now. This is all server side. Okay. Yeah. This is how to build your, your server mobile, uh, your mobile backend for, for your mobile solution. The backend for your mobile solution, your own custom name. And um, it addresses similar problems like Node.js, ACAR, um, Play, and um, <coughs> it certainly overlaps with some JE application server fun functionality. And um, what, one nice thing, which, which I heard from, from <coughs> Tim Fox is, uh, People tend to use it as a silver bullet to solve all the problems with with Vertex, uh, but uh, it, it really it has its strengths and it has its its weaknesses. And I think for some of the mobile challenges, especially in regards to scalability and performance, um, it really can play its strengths. So uh, it consists mainly of some um, core APIs, TCP, SSL client, and servers. HTTPS client servers, WebSocket support, file system support, <laughs> and an event bus. And it's 100% uh, asynchronous. Why? Um, the goal is <coughs> to serve as many long-lived uh, connections as possible. Uh, the use cases here are Internet of Things, where machines communicate with each other, where your uh, freezer is talking to your uh, your barbecue, right? <laughs> Don't know why, but people do this. <laughs> and uh, in a world where operating system, uh, operation system threats are a limited and precious resource. So 
what we want to do by using asynchronous APIs. We want to make sure we can serve many connections with few threads. And um, why is that? Because if we block a thread, uh, we can't do any other work with the thread, right? We, we have to make sure we have threads available to, to do, do the work. So um, let me give you a simplified view of typical and traditional application server, server model. <coughs> it's really very abstract and very simplified. Usually, if you have a request coming to your server, to your app server, you get a thread assigned to this, and the thread will do, uh, do all the work, and based um, and as the result of this thread, you will get put out response. Like, and this thread manipulates different objects, and yeah, think of this, for example, to be a server, right? And as you know, if you're in a server context, and if you work on, on shared data, then you have to use the session, you have to use uh, thread local mechanisms, so threading, you have to be a little bit careful about those things. But what happens when, when a new or an additional connection comes in, a new thread is assigned to that connection, and if other connections come in, new threads are spawned, and until we, we exhaust the thread pool size. Right? As many threads as we have in our application service uh, set, set up, and if we run out of threads, um, we can serve, <coughs> serve connections. And uh, here, the, 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 the law of diminishing returns comes through, is the more threads we add, the more overhead we get, and all the gain we have from from using more more threads, serving more connections, this this uh, degrades, and you you don't get as much back as as you expect, and the resources are really limited. So Vertex is a little bit different. In in Vertex, we have the concept of a, of an event loop. Um, who who is familiar with the reactor or multi-reactor pattern? Have you used it? Or it's, it's very similar to, or it's the same, same thing like Node.js uses. Um, you have a run loop, which is basically a, basically a, a thread, and um, you have a deployment unit called <coughs> verticals, and these deployment units assigned, are assigned to this, this thread. And this run loop, uh, what it basically does, uh, it loops, it runs, and you can register handlers on this event loop. And whenever something is happening, data coming in, or data has to be sent out, uh, the handlers, the callbacks, are called to do this work. Okay? And um, to, to explain this, a vertex instance is typically one JVM. And within this instance, we have um, a composition of many verticals which make up your app. And one vertical is assigned one thread. If I have one vertical called my app, I can run it with vertex run my app from the command line when this vertical is started. So I can also use run my app instances free. This, mean, this means that free event loops will be started. And um, I will get three instances of my, of my app. Um, one thing, typic typically, you use as many instances as you have cores in your <coughs> system. Because you only, otherwise you have always the switching between threads, sharing the resources, the, the cores. <coughs> So typically, you only have as many instances or event loops as you have uh, cores in your in your system, and each of these verticals has an isolated class loader. This this is a great thing because it allows you to write single-threaded code. You you can always be sure that if you're in a vertical 
that you are the only thread working in this this vertical, and this really simplifies the things how you yeah, you save state or work work with state in your app application. Yeah. You don't have to take care about synchronization between different threads and concurrency programming multi-threading, as as you know this is really difficult to get this right. So uh, the model here is more more an <coughs> actor-like model. It's it's not like the actor model from Scala, but a bit more more similar because uh, we need some inter-process communication. How do we get data from one vertical to another vertical? So the solution from Vertex here is to provide an event bus and for example I have one JVM here with three verticals running. I can send messages to the event bus uh, to communicate between these verticals. I can also start another, <coughs> a second JVM, and the JVM, uh, the event bus, can even communicate to other JVMs. Uh, in the background, it uses uh, uh, ZeroConf and Hazelcast to do the clustering, and I can start my JVMs with a minus dash cluster mode and use the event bus, and I send one message in JVM1 to the event bus and I receive it in, in the other JVM. And this goes even further. Um, I can use a JavaScript API and can even send uh, events to my browser. So this is just another client, vertical client. And uh, in the background, the event bus uses uh, web sockets or Socks.io, Socks.js, all these frameworks, I'm not a web developer, uh, but in the examples I've seen, this works pretty well. So the entry point from the UI is the event bus, and that's how it's orchestrated. Um, if, if UI, usually you, you don't have a UI here, it's a server side. Uh, this is server side, but from the, from yeah, the, from the client. Yeah, from the browser, yeah. yeah you, from the client. But it works two ways, right? In the browser, you can enter some data, send it on the event bus, and then it will be received on the server side. But also, if you have, for example, a, a timer, a background thread running on a server, you can push data into your browsers. Uh, this, this is re really nice. Uh, I've seen an example where yeah, data is updated on the mm -hmm. server side, and all the browsers, it was a chat example, when the messages pop up in every browser. And, um, Vertex provides a, a simple um, JavaScript API. There's just a event bus, register handler on message, and then send message. You can send messages. I mentioned um, it's polyglot. This means you can write your, your code in different languages. Um, it all uh, looks very uh, similar in this example, closer to this example, the Java version, because we're in the Java user group, right? Um, what you have to do to create a vertical is you extend vertical and you have to implement the lifecycle method star. And here I can say create an HTTP server. Uh, this is not that important at the moment. And you can register a request handler and with an anonymous function you can implement the callback the handle method you get an HTTP request and for example here if the request path equals slash uh, you load the, the index.html file otherwise you load whatever file is under your web root directory this is a very simple simple HTTP server it's only little code to, to create this, and you tell the server on which port, port to run. Okay, <coughs> so uh, let's look at, at one example.
Um, the, the code I put here is also available on uh, GitHub, where you can download all the example code. I share the link a little bit later. Just out of curiosity, Vertex has a, a plugin or a, a development environment for Eclipse as well. Um, no, <laughs> um, you, you have to, to 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 create it by yourself. Also, I had to customize it for running it with IntelliJ. Usually, I'm an Eclipse user, but um, for my vacation here, <laughs> I bought IntelliJ. <laughs> about half during my vacation, I can... You know how to party, sir. <laughs> <coughs> I know somebody who's hiring. <laughs> I also have a VI. <laughs> 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 Sucker um, in Emacs. <laughs> yeah. Actually, what you see here, it's, it's the same code I, I showed you to start a simple server. And... Um, we can build it. Uh, the, the build system preferred by Vertex is Gradle, but you can also build it with uh, with Maven or or Ant. module. I put all my code inside of a module. This is another thing you can do. You can package your code into a module and redistribute this via a module. And I can simply simply start my server. And now <coughs> if I hit eighty ninety I get this index HTML. But very simple to set, set up set up the server. So okay. um, I did a little very simple benchmark. Uh, this <coughs> is not I think there are <coughs> many things you have need to take into consideration when you're creating a benchmark. So this is really simplified. Just out of curiosity I wanted to get, get a first impression on how this code performs uh, to the same thing uh, created with uh, JuxRS <coughs> running on JBoss. If I create the same, if I give them the same uh, uh, size and everything and use it just plain out, out of the box without uh, changing things and I simply yeah, create, uh, register the uh, world endpoint and uh, provide pro pro the index HTML file from the file system, right? So it does basically the same thing uh, than the other example. So uh, I use this <coughs> to to run run the test with fifty concurrent um, clients and two hundred requests, and this is the JBoss version, and you can see uh, the memory usage goes up, uh, the threads. 
went up really f really fast. So I'm using all all the the threads and the a lot of objects are allocated and memory is is used. I was able to run 548 transactions per second second with this um, client, and then I did the same with um, Vertex. Started it and ran the same siege uh, benchmark. And if we have a look at the resource usage here, we say uh, the number of threads is constant, it's, it's limited, it did not go up, and the memory usage is, is much, much lower. And also, uh, not only the memory usage, but the uh, the amount of memory which is which is um, <coughs> created for the example, and I was able to get six like, six hundred fifty transactions per second with this example. Um, I did this a couple of times and found out that at least on my notebook, uh, Vertex was a little bit faster, I could do more transactions per second, and um, the memory consumption was much lower, because you don't allocate so many things on the heap, you just have this run loop and the stack, right, and um, there's no need to, to create these many, many, many objects, and from a memory baseline, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot less memory, which is which is required here for for using using vertex and yes. oh I, I was going to wait till you finished but that's why I was raising yeah. um, for something simple like um, this that sounds great but how are you were you going to include something like accessing a database and I will come, okay come to that. In two slides <laughs> two slides, <laughs> two slides. <laughs> actually one slide. <laughs> ten slides. <laughs> yeah. So um, this was just for, out of curiosity, a first impression, and we made another uh, benchmark where we could see um, also with the client on another uh, server uh, uh, and uh, another PC connecting to to the server because here the the test client and the server run on the same machine, so it's mm, yeah okay, maybe not the best benchmark in the world, right? Um, and there we we uh, we we, uh, we added the number of concurrent users and the number of times the test is run, and we got to a point where where JBoss was not able to respond, and you had many requests that said, okay, uh, run out of connections, I can't provide you data, and uh, Vertex reduced the the response times, were decreased. But all the time we got a uh, connection and, and a response. So this was uh, really nice to see at this uh, example. I think you can get more with JBoss if you tweak all the thread pools and do all the, the like voodoo magic uh, there. But uh, typically, an event loop based server should scale better. Um, this is the reason why also. Uh, Servers like Nginx are becoming more and more popular in contrast to uh, to Apache, or as a rival to Apache, because they also use internally event loops, and these mechanisms they are able to to handle much more, many more connections simultaneously. It does not necessarily say that the servers are faster, mm -hmm. but they don't run out of resources as quickly as uh, as traditional servers do. So um, now we want to communicate with another vertical. Okay. Our goal in the end is to access a database and write data into a database <coughs> and retrieve, retrieve data from a database. So the next step is okay, let's run in a different server uh, vertical. We call it uh, SD uh, backend. <coughs> and um, we get the event bus and register a handler on the event bus. 
how to register it, you make it addressable just via a string. And uh, it would make it makes sense to, to think of some kind of naming uh, <coughs> scheme here to identify your components, but it's just a string. And you register this handler. And whenever a message is sent to a CIAC event bus message, <coughs> this handler is triggered with the handle message uh, method, and you get this callback. Okay. On the server side, um, to send a message is really easy. You get the event bus, uh, say event bus sent, then the address, and then the message. Here you can um, JSON objects, you can send uh, primitives, and things which are serializable. Um, so let's look at two aspects using this. <coughs> One is the event bus in action, and the <coughs> load balancing capabilities. Because when I say send, uh, and I have registered, um, okay, put it another way, I have one client and two backend JVMs. And if I send a message to the event bus, I get automatic load balancing between these two JVMs. And if one JVM uh, is not responding or is, is broken, then the other JVM takes over uh, the, the, the load. Um, Apart from just sending this point-to-point -point communication, <coughs> I can also do a pub-sub so that every uh, receiver uh, gets gets the message and can can do something. <coughs> so, Here's the client, okay. I, I just added the event bus after, after serving the, the HTML. I just sent the, this is my test message to the address <coughs> SDI event bus message. Okay, I, I wrapped this into a JSON object here. So very simple, straightforward, not, not a lot of code. This one's written in Scala. Scala. Uh, no, this is Java. This is Java. It's just the. Uh, ah, uh, I was looking at the assignment. Uh, IntelliJ. Okay. It's not valid Java. Can you yeah. just uh, collapse it again? Does it look like Groovy all of a sudden? Yeah, this is a, an IntelliJ feature to make it uh, uh, easier. This is not Java. Okay. Easier to, to, to look at the folding. Okay. So. Also, there's not a lot going on. We register the handler and just respond to this event. Just what you saw on the slides, right? So, smaller. the first time I used Gradle. Does anyone of you have experience with Gradle? To this stuff? Okay. No? Okay. So, I hope you're right. <laughs> On my next vacation. <laughs> <laughs> if you were living in Germany in the winter, you would think coming here to learn Java would be a vacation. <laughs>
how the server is running, right? And the backend. Now we have two, two JVMs running, so we have to, to start them in cluster mode. So, I just, just tell Plaza it's, it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> these are these things, and you, you sit there and wonder for hours why things are not working. <laughs> <laughs> and you look at the code and... <coughs> That's why you should take a vacation. <laughs> JVMs, they find each other, they do multicasts in the network and uh, use Hazelcast for the communication. So now I send a request and you see I received uh, the message in, in the other JVM. Right? Okay. Okay. Let's uh, create another JVM. And it's running cluster mode. And we started in a different form. character in front mm -hmm. of because it's starting to you yeah. so it's yeah. Yeah. Uh, you before you SD know. jug you have a weird character between oh. run after run mod. Yeah. The guru is strong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> strong server. Um, okay. Now we see Every time the, the uh, responses here are alternating, no I get it on, on the window top and then the next request. Oh, right? <coughs> I get automatic load balancing. I think this is great, especially if you think about long running tasks and uh, scaling. Yeah. If you have uh, a lot of virtual machines and if some, something breaks and one, one JVM is going <laughs> down, it's really easy to, to, to scale here on, on one server and you can put these also in the network on, on different um, different machines and it will it will work. I think this, this is a great feature and it's really simple to, to easy to set up. And also if I shut down one server, the other one is taking <coughs> taking over the work here. Um, you mentioned that the nodes discover each other with IP multicast. Mm -hmm. Does that present a problem in some cloud environments where multicast is not so reliable um, or doesn't work at all? I, I, I think out of the box it's a problem. <coughs> but um, as I mentioned in the background, um, it uses Hazelcast. I don't know if you know. I don't know Hazelcast. It's, it's, it? it's, it's a framework for uh, distribu distributing. Um, data on several JVMs, oh. and it uses this uh, zero conf protocol. And there's also a configuration which you can use, and where you can write uh, instead of using multicast. As far I haven't done it yet, but I just read about it that you can directly enter the the, no the nodes okay. which you want to use, and then uh, TCP socket connections are used for the communication oh, okay. between the devices. But I haven't used that yet. I don't know how good it works. Okay. So, okay. but I think this this is this is really really nice feature. Yeah. Okay. So, um, my next thing is okay. We just have this one one endpoint. Would it be nice if we have different endpoints? Because in the end, 
Now, our goal is to, we want to create a data store, right? A dynamic data store. So, and we might have different collections or different resources. So, we should be able to address this di different um, resources on the server. Uh, what you can use in Vertex is the root matcher. And it's yeah, really s simple. You, you set up uh, a new instance of a root matcher and you provide it with, with an endpoint. You can, you can use uh, regular expressions and uh, define all kinds of endpoints and rules, parameters which are encoded in, uh, in the endpoints. Here this is a static endpoint, just seeing sensor data. And um, you becomes also uh, the asynchronous character because you send the request to another vertical, but you don't know when the response comes in. And you don't want to block uh, the, the event loop until the, for the response. So you just register another event ha handler here and say, okay, whenever the response is, is ready, is coming, uh, call this event handler. This means uh, after this message is sent, the event loop continues and can serve new connections. It continues working and at some point in time, the response is ready from the backend service or from the database, and it says, hey, event loop, here's your data, and then Vertex associates this data with the connection, initial connection, and sends back the correct data. So with really a few, few resources and threads, event loops, you can serve uh, hundreds and thousands of connections at the same time. And to, to set up the root matcher, you just uh, register it as a request handler on the server. Let's uh, see this in action. Here's our, uh, our server code. Uh, we created a room matcher and we registered a route for a GET request and for a POST request. Okay. This means when I get a GET request for this resource, um, run this code. So, and this code does just send this message uh, a JSON object uh, to, to our load. Uh, to whatever vertical is registered under the message load. Whenever I get a POST request, I extract the, uh, the body from my POST. And again, this is asynchronous uh, because I have the possibility while maybe uh, the, the content of my request, the body, uh, can be provided in a streaming uh, fashion. I have the possibility to react on the, uh, based on the things I read from the stream. Yeah. But in this example, I, I read in the whole stream, and once I have filled the whole buffer with the body from my post, uh, say request end handler, this means the whole body is read, then send uh, the body to, to the save. I send, send this, this object I read in the JSON to, to, to the event bus. And here I register just reply and just tell me, okay, here's the response <coughs> for this data. If I look. At the server side implementation. I registered two, two messages to set up two addresses, one the load and one save, and registered two, two event handlers. Um, and at the moment, they just print out. Print out that the message was received on different channels. Okay? And, oh, no, here for the, for the post, I call a process save, and usually when you when you post an object to a server, it 
rest, this means um, you will get get a response back, usually uh, HTTP 201, 201, created message with a location header in it, with a URL pointing to the object you just created. Okay, this is a very common, common REST style. Okay, and right, for this example, I just um, created an ID with a timestamp. So, let's see if this is working. Um, is this too fast, too slow? Should I, is this okay from the speed? REST line, and now when I send a GET request, <coughs> okay, I get the message loaded data, right? This goes to the load message, and I can post some data. I prepared here some, some example JSON, okay, and I post the data, and I get back at 201 created, and in the header, location I get the timestamp ID which I created. So we had this one round trip <coughs> to the, the post and a get to our uh, server vertical. We sent this message to the event bus and we had an, a backend vertical listening for these events for the load and, and get and rigged it differently based on on the message which I sent. And this all was asynchronous. Okay? While he was working on one message before he sent back the reply. Uh, I'm able to to work on different new connections. Okay, any questions so far for this? And what you see here, this is really the, the basics. And this pattern mm -hmm. is uh, you see this pattern throughout all 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 vertex. It's in every API. It's always the same like this. So now we um, have a server uh, which can receive uh, a GET request uh, where we can post data and communicate with a, with a backend vertical to, to do some, some, some work for us. And the um, next thing is we want to be able to, to send data, to post data to our endpoint, any kind of um, JSON data, any structure we could think of, and we want the backend to be able to save this data. And we want the backend to be able then to, to provide a REST endpoint for us where we can get this data back. So this is a really easy way to, to create dynamic databases, things like PaaS, and, and all this uh, commercial or, or um, backend as a service solutions provide, and we want to build our own service right now. And the question was, uh, okay, what data store should we use? Um, I tried things with CouchDB. Mm -hmm. This also works nice. It's, it's a document-based NoSQL uh, database. Mm -hmm. And for this example, I wanted to try out uh, MongoDB. Has anyone heard of MongoDB? Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah, it's a... <coughs> It's a document-based NoSQL database, and um, it has great features. And 
Um, I think it's a production-ready version for these small enterprise applications. Um, there, it has many capabilities for scaling, um, auto sharding, replication, uh, high availability, and um, it provides an engine for, for map, doing map and reduce. So I think from the perspective of having a scalable and performant backend, uh, this seemed to be a good choice for me. So um, I used this one. And the great thing about this is some, some people from the Vertex community already built a module for MongoDB, a MongoDB persistor. This means they took the MongoDB driver and provided an event bus service interface, which can take JSON messages with MongoDB-like syntax as real um, JSON objects. Um, MongoDB uses, uses uh, Bison. It's, it's a derivative of mm -hmm. its binary JSON. JSON. It's a little bit different, but uh, this um, MongoDB persistor from Vertex, they wrapped it in a way that you can provide um, regular JSON objects to it and integrate this. So I thought this might be a good idea to, to use, to leverage the module system from Vertex. They're trying to build up this, like in Node.js with the NPM, uh, with the uh, packet manager, uh, and what you have with, with Homebrew or app get on Linux system, they try to provide these modules and put them in a and share them via a repository so you can reuse things and you can um, contribute to the project by providing your own services and, and verticals. At the moment, I think there are maybe 20, 20 uh, modules for reading JDBC databases, um, MongoDB, accessing different kind of, different kind of backend systems and OAuth security session manager. Uh, Etc. So let's see how, how this works. Um, if I want to use the, the Mongo persistor, there are two things I need to do. I need to add something to my mod uh, configuration file to my module, which simply said, says I have a dependency to this, this module, and if it is not already installed, it will check out it from the Git repository from GitHub and install it to my machine. This is really nice. So I don't have to, it's like uh, yeah, ma Maven. Yeah, it resolves my dependencies on the first start. It downloads it into a mods uh, a directory and th then I have, have it and can use this module. And um, in my code, if I want to communicate with this module, I have to, to set it up and deploy this, this module. And I just create a JSON configuration here. I could also create it in a file and provide it on the command line. <coughs> um, but here I set it up in, in code. Um, just how to connect to the MongoDB. And I set, just set deploy module with this configuration. And then the Mongo module is, is set up and I can save and retrieve, retrieve data from, from MongoDB. Um, <coughs> let's see how this looks like. Basically, um, what I've done here, because we, we um, don't want to save everything in the sensor data database, we want to be able to on the fly create new collections in MongoDB. And for this reason, we said, okay, um, we set up a, a post resource with the prefix data store, and then we provide a collection in which we want to save the data, and if it's not already available in MongoDB, 
the table and then it, it will create it for me on the first post. And um, next thing is I just send this this data uh, together with a with a created timestamp if if it's not already provided to to my event bus again to my backend server. And for the get request, uh, it's it's the same thing. I put in the collection name, which from which I want to retrieve the data, and send it to my backend service. So nothing nothing new, nothing special here. Now, um, let's first have a look at the process load. This method is called when I get a, a load request. Okay, What am I doing? I, I'm creating a JSON object. Uh, I'm telling for, for Mongo, MongoDB, telling, okay, the action is I want to find data. Uh, the collection is the one I provide via my message. Um, I want to sort, to sort um, in an ascending descending order and as a matcher I have an empty query. The matcher is something like the where, where clause in the SQL statement. I could provide a JSON object containing attributes which have to match to identify the data I want to find. Okay, but this is MongoDB and there's a syntax where I can also use uh, greater than, uh, less, less than and all kind of uh, yeah, relational uh, or predicates, some predicate logic into the matcher. Right now I say, okay, I want to have everything, so I provide an empty JSON object. Okay. And um, I send this to, to the message queue for which I set up the Mongo module. Okay. When I deployed uh, the Mon Mongo module, I think I have to copy it. Deploy Mongo module. Uh, I said this module listens on assume event bus mon Mongo. Okay. If I send something on the event bus to this address, uh, the Mongo DB module will get the request. So I send this JSON here. And for the save request, I do the same. I just say the action is save. MongoDB supports uh, save, update, delete, find, find one, and of all things you can think of. And I also provide the property, which is uh, the message body. This is the object I posted <coughs> yeah, to my to my server. Okay. So. right now uh, I started it before because for the first time when I started and I call this deploy mongo module it you could actually see uh, an output here saying downloading uh, the mongo module from github and installing it so but I've already done this so I'll see it. okay um, here I connected to my MongoDB, 
and let's see what collections we have in it. And right now there's only this, uh, this is MongoDB shell. Uh, we only have this, oops. System indexes. So let's create some data, okay? Um, call it data store. And we want to call our database, um, for example. Okay. And we want to post this data. Okay. We get it to one created. And right now, if I look to my MongoDB, I see a new table, a new database is created. <coughs> is here. And I can. query and I see all oh, my data is inserted into the database and on the other side I can now also do a get request and I will retrieve I will retrieve the data from the database. So we can on the fly create tables in MongoDB and save any kind of of uh, of objects there. And um, one thing where, where we use this or to, to test this, just with this little test generator, I hope it runs. Oh, it's not powering up. Unfortunately. Maybe I shouldn't put it into the Ethernet port. <laughs> <laughs> the USB socket yeah. fits perfectly in the Ethernet port. Yeah. <laughs> Still going <on> iron? <laughs> yes. I'm <laughs> figuring it out very quick. <laughs> um, what we have here is. Uh, a li little uh, test data generator with this Arduino device. Uh, we have a flex sensor, and based on how much I bend this, we create different sensor data. And this communicates via the serial port, because I don't have a GSM module, we have uh, the serial port to uh, a GVM here, and the GS GVM sends the sensor data uh, to the rest endpoint just created. Okay? So if I put up a new sensor and configure it with a new name with for a different endpoint, maybe uh, this could be a washing machine and I have a freezer sensor. I put them up, just configure the, the endpoints. Um, I have a backend system which can collect all the data. Uh, and here we, we and then we, we have a big big data um, scenario here, where all things like mapping, reduce, evaluating data, um, you can all apply this here really easily. And you can set up new sensors, new devices really quickly and integrate them with your, um, with your cloud in a machine-to-machine -machine scenario. Um, to illustrate this, I also set up a little iOS client which is nothing, nothing special. It just uh, connects to the REST endpoint and gets the data. And now I've collected some data. Let's produce some lower levels with some lower values. And if I refresh, you see how this mm -hmm. new sensor data coming in here. So it was. Um, really quick and easy to pro provide this whole uh, deep slice from the architecture, from the database to the actual device sensor providing the data and another device reading the data. And, uh, and uh, we, we are sure that um, our architecture and framework technology we use is able to be scaled. Yeah? So, 
maybe this is not projection code, right? Um, it's for sure uh, there's a lot of effort to be put into this, but I think it's a it's a good and easy way to to get started and provide your own custom custom solutions to to build something, yeah, to to, to get ready because there uh, it's a highly innovative area mm -hmm. with new challenges and new 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 ideas coming up and. I think you, you need the, the right tools and technology uh, which does not stop you from building something. And I consider MongoDB and Vertex to be a framework which, yeah, which, which enables me to do things quick, quickly. So, so some final thoughts. Um, if you're building mobile backend solutions, keep the mobile specialties in mind, which we haven't talked before. Um, there are many mobile backend as a service solutions available yet. If they do the job for you, great. And if it's okay for your, your requirements to use a cloud service to have your data somewhere else, not under your control, great. There are things you can use. But on the other side, uh, there are already some really powerful JVM-based solutions and technologies which you can leverage and, and use today to build your own mobile backend as, as a service, your custom, custom solution. And uh, the key to create performant and scalable solution is really to think about asynchronity and uh, uh, responsive UIs and uh, about this, this loose coupling and processes between request and response, the event loop approach. I have to put it in better words. But uh, th this kind of architectural style, not to think about request response, um, but also <coughs> receiving something at a different uh, time, in a different timing, based on the available resources. Um, another important aspect which I didn't touch here, is uh, caching and keep data offline. This is a very important tool. Um, for example, he here, uh, the next step would be to integrate the HTTP headers to say, okay, uh, I give one of these, these requests, maybe a cache control, a timestamp, and say, uh, I'm only interested in data uh, which is older, uh, which is newer than uh, which, um, for me, five minutes of having this data is okay. So don't you don't really need to send a new request request out. And use e-tags to see if things have changed. And use the data, um, the data size, which is transferred at the moment. At the moment, everything is trans transferred to, to the client. This is not very uh, economical. And um, when you're building mobile, mobile solutions, uh, always expect the worst case. It's uh, really what, what I learned. It's uh, if you have devices in the hands of users out there, different kinds of devices, all the different brands, the different technologies, the different ways people use them, mobile devices and the mobile apps, um, you get constellations and things to cope with on, on your server. Uh, you, you can't think of, of that all. But just to be prepared, if you think you've seen the worst, someone else will, will do something totally crazy with your app and you will be in big trouble, so better be prepared for that. <coughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Any final questions? Have one question about I know it's all good for new products, <coughs> but in reality, there will be a lot of existing backend services for regular stuff, right? Okay. How do you see a pattern of solving that with this approach? Um, actually, one, one way you, you could approach this is to think okay, you have your existing services and uh, use this technology as, as the gateway as an integration point 
to connect to your services and, and provide this as your endpoint to your new your mobile devices. So really it's not to make something new, but to extend it, to make it be better for mobile uh, and many connection use cases. So really you could use it as an extension and not as to exchange something which is existing. Okay, great. Thank you again very much.